Hi, everybody. Hope you're all doing great today. Thanks for coming. My name is Brittany and I will be your studio host today with Etcher. We have the lovely Roisin and she will be doing a uh, beautiful figure drawing for us. Uh, I'll let uh, Roisin take over and she'll show us um, just some examples of her style. Uh, but actually, sorry, just before that, I'll explain if you're new to the process, how our chat works. It's very simple. Uh, just if you have a question versus a comment, just make sure you type the question in all caps so I can, excuse me, defer it easier from a comment. Um, we do a Q&A at the end. So any non-relevant questions to what Roshan is doing in the moment, or if they're just about materials and stuff, I'm going to save them for the end, just so she can um, get through the intro seamlessly. And um, anything else uh, info wise, I'll just casually drop stuff into the chat. So just make sure that you pay attention to little things. Um, she will be doing a, another workshop with us upcoming on April 19th. So I'll drop uh, links and more info uh, in the chat later. Uh, thank you for uh, paying attention to my little intro there and we'll get right into it. Roshni? Hi, thanks so much Brittany. Um, really, really lovely to be here with you guys today. Um, so today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a few examples of um, my, my, my quick captures in the world of, I suppose, urban sketching. So um, I am a sketch artist, first and foremost, and um, I'm all about catching the live. So um, and I love people above all. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of um, this is one of my lockdown sketchbooks from last year. As you can see, this is just a month. My goodness, I must have been going nuts to sketch so constantly. So, um, well, I was, I mean, we all were. So this is an example of, this is the only example in my whole book that is done from a photo. Um, but I really liked my son's haircut. It was my first haircut um, of, of the COVID era and my first haircut ever of, a, of, a, of, of my son. Um, but the, the reason I'm happy to show it to you is because it's, it shows the um, color palette of the skin tones that I'm going to go through with you today. So let me just check. Okay, so this is much more typical. This is again my son um, cooking pizza, um, and I'm not too concerned about accuracy. As you can see, he's got a hand growing out of the middle of his chest, um, and as you can see, he moved. But once I get my shape down, the, then the important, the important thing is to be super, super fast, and I stick to this really, really limited little palette that well, I'm going to tell you all about today. I have a couple of more um, <clears throat> humans, humans in my family. Um, so again, a really good example of the way I throw on the paint, as you can see, there's a bit of a cauliflower bloom down in his neck. I really don't care about anything like that. As a sketcher, all I'm concerned about is capturing a feeling, a moment in time. And um, so I wouldn't really call my work portraits exactly. I would call them quick captures. Uh, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. Let me see if I've got another one. I've got a nice one here somewhere. So this is my daughter. So she's sitting in a chair, she's chatting on the phone to her friend, and I just literally throw down the lines and I throw down the paint. And the important thing is speed, speed of, above all. So let me see if I have another one. That's the two teenagers sitting there uh, watching their games, run out of one colour ink halfway through. This is typical of when you're sketching, something goes wrong. It's not like when you're sitting there in your studio and you've got all your goods and, and, and bits and pieces with you. So there are a few little examples of humans. Um, I don't think I have any more in this particular book. Oh, a quick one. Again, my son, um, he's very obliging, as you can tell. Um, he'll stay still when I ask him, but you won't get many more, more than about half a minute out of him. Um, and as an urban sketcher, you are always going to be under time pressure, which is why it's so, so important to have the color palette at your fingertips and to be really comfortable with mixing up your colors. And now I'm going to go through the three sketches that I'm going to try and get done in the hour that we have. This is my older daughter. Um, she was quite still because she was uh, watching a YouTube. But again, I look out for the lights and I look out for that. I always use the same color palette. Um, and I, as I say, we'll go through that now in a minute. Um, do, 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 do. Here is my younger daughter. This is a slightly older sketch. And very, very important in this particular sketch, it was made in strong sunlight. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about how to catch that feeling of light hitting a limb because getting the color right is fine as an urban sketcher. Once you've learned your color, you're fine, you're home and dry. 
you can learn it off by heart, but you have to introduce the element of light. No, mind, don't mind Pink Panther. I think Federico had Pink Panther print on his shirt, but you can see there his face. He's got the light hitting his nose and his cheek. You can see a little stream, a little line of light. And of course with watercolor, light is always the absence of color. Okay, it's never white paint. I mean, this is kind of watercolor 101, but if nobody tells you, you don't know. So, you know, forgive me if it's something that you know already. So first of all, what are the five colors that I like to use? So it just so happens, I was telling Brittany a minute ago, um, Etcher have been so kind as to send me a most beautiful little ceramic palette. So it comes in a little, a little circle like this. And then this is the 37 well palette. So you can see there's there's, if you're going in the field doing some sketching, you, you certainly wouldn't be short of um, colors to choose. And I'm really glad, and it comes in a little tin like this, and I'm really glad it's arrived because I'm going to show you the five colors that I use. And I'm going to squirt a little drop into one of these little palettes, and that's what I'm going to use. So the five colors that I use, and you can get any skin tone with these five colors, are Payne's Gray. So this happens to be, um, this happens to be the Schmincke brand but I also love to use the uh, Roman Schmal brand and that's the one I use uh, I don't happen to have any in a tube but the Roman Schmal is the one that I use um, on a daily basis simply because it's just a really really nice shade it's not too blue it's not too gray it's just somewhere in between the next color I'm going to squeeze in here is burnt umber okay so burnt umber is a uh, this is a Schmincke brand again um there are lots of brands that have burnt umber. They all do burnt umber. And some I like and some I like less. Some I like more, some I like less. So the next color I'm going for is transparent red oxide. Um, but you can use burnt sienna. It makes no difference, really. I just happen to really like transparent oxide at the moment. I'm kind of going through a bit of a transparent red oxide phase. But uh, as I say, any reddish brown is perfect. So this is the Daniel Smith brand. Absolutely gorgeous shade of ruddy brown. So the next color in our little five set is yellow ochre. And this one is an artist's brand of Dale Rowney, artist grade of Dale Rowney. But normally I would use, um, to be honest with you, yellow ochre is pretty much yellow ochre. I mean, I, I'm open to being corrected, but I have never used a yellow ochre that I don't find really, you know, adequate and up to the job. So that one was Dale Rowney, but I, again, I love the Roman Schmal brand. So he makes the Aquarius, um, uh, the Aquarius range. Now, all of these four colors are well known to you. Payne's Gray, Burnt Umber, let's say Burnt Sienna, or Transparent Red Oxide, or Venetian Red. They're all colors that you're very familiar with and Yellow Ochre. The next one is a color that you might not be so familiar with, but I would never not have it in a palette of mine. And it's a crazy intense pink. And believe it or not, I absolutely love it for my human sketches. So this is Opera and it's by Shin Han Premium. Um, it's just called Opera, but in the Schmincke, uh, actually I don't know what it's called in Schmincke or even if they do one, but when Daniel Smith it's called Opera Pink and in Windsor Newton it's called Opera Rose. And what they have in common is they're crazy, crazy hot pink. And I'm gonna show you, first of all, um, we're, I'm just gonna draw a series of little boxes and I'm going to get you to do the same if you're following along. So and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you three different dilutions of each of those five colors. So there's my first row of five. Doesn't matter how big, how big they are, just big enough to get a decent little bit of a color in. And I'm just going to draw two more rows underneath the first row. Now, you're going to be wondering what type of ink I'm using. So I always use diatromentous ink and it's document ink. And the reason I use that is because it never clogs my pen. And that, that's not to say there aren't millions of lots of other fantastic inks that will never clog your pen. But I happen to really, really rate this particular ink. Ever since I've used it, it's never clogged my pens. They always work seamlessly. And as an instructor, I have often had to take people's pens and go and wash them out somewhere because they're struggling to get them to flow. So, as I say, there's millions of fantastic inks. I used to love noodlers as well um, until I just couldn't get some for some reason. So I moved on to the Diatromentus and it's great. OK, so um, 
I have had people ask me how to what order do you put the brush, the paint and the water? So I'm going to assume you've never picked up um, watercolor before. And I'm going to say the first thing I do is I wet my brush. This is my lovely little sketching water container. Um, and a little bit about my sketching water container is it's um, Brittany, can the viewers see me as well as the downward camera at the moment? Uh, no, they just see your workspace. OK, moment. that's fine. That's fine. I just wanted to show kind of it because it's hard to show the water container without, you know, spilling it <laughs> uh, if I was to put it sideways. But it's a fun, I highly recommend it. It's sold as a brush washer. Look for stainless steel brush washer. It comes with a lid with um, a rubber seal. So it's light. It's it's completely smash proof. Uh, really sturdy, holds loads of water. And I've had mine for years and it's brilliant in the field. So I'm just dampening my brush a little bit and I'm going to put some quite concentrated Payne's Grey into the first little box on the left. You can see it's super dark. So that's less water. I'm not going to say more paint. It's the water that makes the difference. Um, we just got a couple questions here for you. Yes, go first. Yeah. Um, what kind of paper are you using? Right now, right now I am using. Um, it's a brand called Gold Line, um, and it's two hundred grams. Um, it's very inexpensive, um, and I've I used it for my demos because it's. It's a light grade. It's very, very, um, it's very reliable. But I will say that um, that I, I, my my brand of choice is I have two brands of choice, and I'm not just saying this because Etcher were kind enough to send me a um, a sample of a sketchbook. But for me, the paper is extremely important. Um, if I get the paper wrong, I feel like I can't paint. That's just the way it is. And so many sketchbooks that are sold for sketchers, they have a kind of a film on the surface of the paper that resists the watercolor. I don't understand why they do that, but they do. Um, a lot of people love uh, lots of brands that I can't get on with. So it's very much a personal choice. But for me, it's got to be Hannah Moola, Hannah Moola watercolor sketchbook, which is 200 grams in weight, or the Etcher sketchbooks in the hot pressed paper. I like hot pressed because I do a lot of drawing. So the paper has to be smooth and not snag and grab my, my nib. So for someone who likes to draw a lot, you need a smooth paper. Getting that right balance between a paper that shows the beauty of the watercolor, but still doesn't catch your nib is difficult to find. So if you want to go big bucks, you can go to the arches hot pressed, but um, for they don't they don't make sketchbooks. If they did, I'd probably buy them. Maybe they do now. It's been a while since I looked, but I highly recommend the Hannah Moola 200 gram watercolor sketchbook or the Etcher. And I don't know what the weight of that is, Brittany. I didn't have a look. Let me have a little look at the paper. It's probably 200 grams as well. It's 220 grams. Happy days. A little bit heavier again. That's, oh, heavier. That's brilliant. So, um, so yeah, so um, I'm very excited to have that paper and uh, I really like using it. <clears throat> Excuse me, now I'm going to go for the second little box in the row. And this one should be a sort of a medium dilution. And the reason why I'm showing all these different dilutions is because even though I'm only using five colors, that's my five colors for all skin tones, I do have a sort of a secret weapon, which is that Using them at different dilutions, look at this last one, look how light it is. Using them at different dilutions means that you can mix those colors together. And well, I can't do the maths, but it's five, I don't know, five times five, I don't know. It's lots, lots of variations. So you can mix these colors together in any combination and add in the fact that they're, they had come with different dilutions and there's no skin tone that you can't get. So that's my first one. Now the dilution, the difference in dilution is much stronger with Payne's gray than it is with the other colors. So this is my burnt umber. It's a beautiful, dark, rich brown. And I'm just gonna wash out my brush a little bit, wipe my brush on the side of the, the jar, and I'm gonna go for medium dilution. And I'm gonna wipe my brush on the jar a bit more, and I'm gonna go for super dilute. So you can see that you can get these really amazing range just by the amount of water that you add in. So I'm going to do the third one, give me a little bit of speed up here. Um, and all of these are in my, um, this little chart I'm doing here 
is in the book that uh, Quarto published last December the 22nd uh, in the Urban Sketching Handbook series, which is um, which goes into quite a lot of detail about, about this. That one needs to be a little bit darker, basically. Just want a bit of a difference between the first and the second. And then the last little one is super dilute. So you should be able to conjure up the different dilutions of your colors that you're going to use at the snap of your fingers. You should be really, really um, comfortable with this. And the reason you should be comfortable with this, and it really is just a question of practice. The reason you should be comfortable with this is because as an urban sketcher, as a person doing quick captures in, in the wild, in public, it's hard. It's hard enough to, you have to have all your wits about you. And the last thing you need to do is introduce things that you can learn off by heart in advance. You can't learn off by heart in advance what the people are going to be doing, how long they're going to stay in one position, but you can learn off by heart your little palette, your go-to palette. Just going to pop a little bit of nice intense. Look at this crazy pink. So I have yet to use this pink neat on any skin. You'll be happy to hear because that would make them very strange completely. So there is a nice medium dilution. So what I'd like you to do, I'm not going to do it now because it would take up the entire class. But what I would like you to do is make something like the same number of boxes again. Whatever we have here, 15, isn't it? And just mix those colors together using different dilutions, experiment, experiment and see what a range of skin colors you can get out of them. Okay, I'm gonna leave those aside. Um, I'm going to start uh, doing my first sketch. I don't know if I've got paint or whatever I have on this page, but hopefully I'll be able to wash it off and dry it in time for when I'm going to draw on that little piece of paper. Sorry, let's get a little bit of tissue. Okay. No worries. Okay. But anyway, we'll draw on the left hand side so we won't eat that, that bit yet. So I'm going to start with my drawing of Honor. That's my eldest daughter. So this is the one I'm going to do now. Now, when you're drawing your loved one, you know that they're going to come up and look at you, the drawing that you've done and they're going to have something to say about it. They're going to either be happy or they're going to be really cross. So it means a lot to you. Plus, it's your loved one. You want to do a nice drawing. So you're under pressure and it means a lot to you to get it right. So one of the ways that I try and make, and yes, I do draw directly in pen. It's something that people ask a lot. I do draw directly in pen. That wasn't always the case. I did draw for my first couple of years as an urban sketcher. I would have drawn in pencil first and gone over everything with a pen. That's normal. Some people are born able to draw directly in pen. I wasn't. It just took a lot of, a lot of ink under the bridge, a lot of practice. But my little tool in my armory is that I use the reverse of my nib. This is a foodie pen. It's a 55 degree foodie pen. And by using the reverse, look at this lovely line. It's got a thick line if you hold it at a very low angle. If you hold it upright, it's got this medium line. And if you flick it over to the back of the nib, look how thin that line is. So that is what I call, I suppose, my searching line. It means that I can scribble away. I can use it like almost like a pencil until I get the shape that I like. And if I make a mistake, I can promise you, not alone is, are you not going to notice it once the paint goes on, but nobody else will either. And they just, they just won't notice it. I have often come back to a drawing that I have done before and I'm very pleased with. And I go, oh my goodness, I gave that person three years. And you literally don't even notice it once the paint goes on. So just remember to be a little bit forgiving of yourself. And I'm going to just tear this page out so that I can put it a little bit close so you can see what I'm doing. So I've started off with her with her eyelashes, nice sweep of eyelashes, I'm giving her just a little. She's a young she's a young person. She's my daughter. So you want to do nice, delicate features. So here's her other eyelash. And as I say, I sketch it in with my the reverse of my nib. I'm not going with my heavy side of my wide line at all because I want to give myself a little bit of leeway to make mistakes and to still be able to proceed with confidence. So a little bit of a, so you can see my lines are the most delicate little lines that I'm using. Little mouth, the upper lip. Oh, I forgot. Really, really important too when you're sketching um, humans is your, where is it now? Da, da, da your white gel pen. So this, I, I would be lost without my white gel pen when it comes to sketching people, <clears throat> excuse me, because 
you will make a mistake. You will put a line in the wrong place. And the reason why you will be cross when you look at your your picture of your human as opposed to your drawing of, I don't know, a river or something like that is because we all know so, so well what humans are supposed to look like. And as soon as you put a tiny bit of a line in the wrong place, you'll notice it. So what I'm going to do is I've already made her chin a little bit too high. So I'm going to ask you when I'm finished to tell me, do you notice that wrong line of the chin? So because I did it in a very, very thin little scratchy line, I'm not too worried. I can either get I can either just ignore it when it's when it's painted or because it's on a little bit of light area. You see her chin is on a little bit of a light area. I can pop a tiny speck of white gel pen on it. I won't do it yet because the, pen, the ink might still be a little bit wet. But once it's dry, I'll be good to go. I'm just going to draw her fingers, which are supporting her head. And she's got a side of her face. So you're all the time searching with your pen for the right, the right position, little strokes, nothing too, nothing too serious. And then you can start pushing in the hair. So I like to grow, I like to grow my sketch from a center point and I always be checking where my line comes out. For example, the side of her hair, I notice it comes out roughly level with the top of her cheekbone. So I start there. So you're you're totally lost in concentration when you're drawing your people and you're constantly asking yourself, where is this position of this particular line supposed to be? This becomes much, much easier with practice. And once you've cracked it, you'll get yourself. I think I've had so many students, well, some of them, some of them don't get it, but a lot of them go, oh my God, the pennies just dropped. And now I know exactly how to get my lines nice and accurate. So you can see, I've just drawn a little searching line there on the outside of her hair. And I wasn't particularly crazy about it. So I went in a little bit. Let's just see if we get a nice little hair. I'm going to draw a few little, a few little lines of hair. She's got a bit of a, a messy, messy bun at the top, something like that. But this will all be picked out nicely with paint. Now I'm not doing too many lines because I want to keep it delicate. I want to keep it nice and delicate. I want to keep it nice and fresh. So I'm trying to do the minimum I can with the lines and I'm going to try and pick out her, her, her high points and low points in her face with paint. So there's her little shape and she's got, she's got her finger on her phone and I'm not too bothered about what the hand's doing. All you have to do is put a phone in and then everybody knows that the person's on a phone. And by the way, you will be drawing a lot of people on their phones. Um, you know, on the one hand, yeah, it'd be nice to be having a few little different poses. But on the other hand, I'm grateful that they do have something that keeps them still. So imagine I've just, I'm in, I'm sitting there drawing my daughter. I know she's going to want to move very soon. So I quickly just throw in my little lines of whatever is not so important, like the blankets around her. And then I start painting. Now, I always start with the lightest colors first for two reasons. I like to have my water nice and clean when I'm painting. Um, and I just, it's just a rule I have, but always, always start with the lightest color first. So to get this particular skin tone, I am going to mix a little bit of yellow ochre into my little palette here. And I'm gonna mix it with a little bit of opera pink or opera because it's the Shinhan premium. And it's just called opera. Really nice quality, by the way. It's one of my favorites I've, I've used. That particular, that particular brand for the opera pink. So there's my color, but I'm looking at them thinking, hmm, is it a bit intense? Is it a bit strong? So I'm just gonna pop a little bit of water in the field next to it, in the well next to it. And I think that's probably a little bit better. But remember that your watercolor always dries lighter than it goes on. And I'm gonna pick out the areas of her face that are slightly out of the strong light first and I can always I can always deepen them up afterwards so on goes the little area under her eyes the socket of her eyes as well so you can see now it's got a little bit of a, a shine in it under the lights just move it around a little bit but you can see I'm beginning to just put in my first layer and all the while I'm asking myself you, you what you do it the old trick of squinting is so good once you start squinting at the area that you're trying to paint 
suddenly it makes the detail begins to disappear and you begin to see the most important characteristics of what you're drawing. So really, really, really useful. I'm just popping a tie. Oh, and by the way, this brush is an Ore 13, which is a Rosemary 13. And it's got a, it's a nice blend of sable and synthetic. So the sable means that it carries lots of, of, um, of, of pigment and water. And the synthetic bit means that it keeps its points very nicely. So again, I'm sticking to my two colors, my opera pink and my yellow ochre in different dilutions. And I'm beginning to put my darks in. So you can see I'm beginning to start forming a little bit of the, of the peaks and troughs of her face. Every time I draw anybody that I know well, anybody in my family, they're going to look different from the next time I draw them and the time they, I drew them previously. But you have to let that go. You just absolutely, if you want to draw your family or your people that you see, you have to not be too worried about getting the likeness, which I know is easier said than done, especially when they're breathing, breathing down your neck. Just have to let it go. So I'm coloring her lips. The top lip is always a little bit darker, a little bit richer paint than the bottom lip. Just going to do a little bit. She has nice full lips. So I'm just getting a little bit of color for the bottom lip. <laughs> Sorry, Roshan, do you mind just saying what brush, uh, what brush you're using again? So this is, it's a brand new one, which is why it's still got the writing on it. It's a Rosemary & Co. travel brush. I only use travel brushes because I work outdoors and in the field uh, all the time. Um, I don't work in the studio, so I have to have a travel brush to protect the tip of the, the brush. So this is an OR13, which approximates, I think, to about a number eight. So... Um, Rosemary doesn't go by conventional numbers for her brushes. She gives them their, her own numbering system. So a NOR 13 is great. It was recommended to me about three years ago and I loved it from the moment I used it. And um, it has recently begun to become very, very fluffy and hairy and damaged. So Rosemary very kindly replaced it for me about, about a month ago. And um, so now I'm back to this lovely pointy brush, but I, I used it almost almost continually for the three years. And that's all I use. I use one other type of brush, which is a, um, a Kalinsky Sable, also a travel brush, and that's by Roman Schmal. And those are the only two brushes. Oh, hang on, one more. I also use a Rigger by Rose Marine Co. And that is fantastic if you're doing any um, grasses or anything like that. Any fine hairs, for example, uh, absolutely brilliant. So that's my brush. Um, between those two brushes, I can do everything. The Kalinsky Sable is brilliant for sloppy things like sloppy skies, something that is a big area that you want to do quickly without any brush strokes. Now, I want to just talk a little bit about what I'm doing here. I've added a little bit of pink to her cheek and pink to the fingertips. So I like, I do like a little bit of pink in a skin tone. I think it warms up. Um, it applies pretty much across the board. Even, it's just a personal thing. I'll even put a little bit of pink into the watercolor where none exists because I just like it. I just think I like the way it, it makes a little blush in the middle of the face. I love a little bit of pink in ears. Again, it's I live in Ireland and people tend to have pink ears and pink nose. <laughs> so that's why I'm, I always have to have my pink in my um, paint box. And I just think this particular pink is a really clean pink and it gives lovely fresh skin tones. Um, I've seen people recommend all sorts of different shades of pink for your skin tones. I. This is my favorite by a long way. So I'm putting a little bit of pink on the tips of the fingers and now I'm going to change up that color for the hands and I'm just making it a bit more yellow ochre -y. and I'm just going to deepen up a little bit and under the chin. Now I've just realized I've forgotten a little line under her lower lip and I'm not going to go in there and fix it now because my paint is wet and then I will have a a great big thick line. So just doing a little bit of a hand and that is it. So I have to wait for her to dry a little bit to do her hair and to do her dressing gown. But as an urban sketcher, you don't have long. You only have seconds. You might have 30 seconds. You might have a minute if you're lucky. Sometimes you've got longer, but you won't need it. What's important is the mix of color that you get. And as I say, play around with those particular shades and play around dilutions you should be able to get every single color from a very very dark skin to the very very lightest skin 
And once you've got, once you're comfortable with the shade that you're using, your next task is light. And as you can see, where's my pen? All the light is coming from here. So she was next to a window. And the light is that direction. So the light is hitting the right hand side of the nose as we're looking at it. It's hitting the right hand side of the neck. It's hitting the expanse of the forehead, just about reaches the cheek on the left hand side of the face and the chin. And I'm just going to use my probably regret this now, but no, nope, I've got away with it. Just want to do a tiny little bit of a line under the chin. But you, I really should be more patient. So face number one. Now I'm going to leave that for a couple of minutes. I'll come back and do the hair in a minute or two. And the next one we're going to do is Federico. So this is my friend Federico. And um, Federico is a wonderful artist um, who lives in Oviedo in northern Spain. Um, and he was very obliging and he sat very still. Well, he wasn't sitting still for me. Nobody ever does. Really. <laughs> No, they don't. They just, they just have other things to do. They don't appreciate us. So, but he was great. He was getting on with the drawing of his own. So I grabbed my moment. Um, something that I comment on, and back to my little skinny side of my pen. Something I comment on on my book, um, which is something that I made up, and I'm quite pleased with myself about it. So I shall pass it on. Um, when you're sketching people, you have to be. Uh, how should I say it? Oh yeah. Um, oh, I know you have to be a detective so the first thing you have to do is be a detective and you, I remember that because it was good but anyway so be a detective you look at your subject and you ask yourself how long are they going to be there are they likely to get up and move so it wouldn't be uncommon for me to watch someone drink um, or um, and see how fast they're drinking it before I decide to uh, make them a subject because sometimes you only have 20 minutes in a cafe and you've got the whole cafe to fit in and all and, and lots of nice people to fit in. Now I'm just drawing Federico's profile. And once again, I'm using the reverse of my nib so that I can use those nice scratchy searching lines. Here's his eyebrow and his eye. And the eye is nothing but just the tiniest little almost closed triangle. See that? The top eyelash just sticking out a tiny bit more. But I haven't bothered putting eyeballs in because you can't see them. His eyes are almost closed as he looks down. So I look at the drinks and I'll also ask. I certainly won't be slow to ask the waiter or the waitress. And I'll say, um, excuse me, I'm just drawing that person over there. Do you think they're going to be there for a while? And they are great. They're absolutely brilliant. They say, oh, don't worry, I just brought them another glass of wine or whatever it is. So um, it's great to know in advance a little bit of um, how long you're going to get. And if you can't guess, just ask. Ask the server and they'll help you. So I'm just getting onto his moustache. It's quite a prickly moustache, kind of a little bit um, scratchy looking. So he's got a little bit of a goatee under his chin. And he's got more little bits of scratchy bits. So that's where your fountain pen is really, really brilliant because you can get these little scratchy lines in like that. But as you can see, I haven't committed to anything yet in terms of lines. Oh, and by the way, I mentioned earlier about making mistakes and not noticing them. Do you see the way I drew Federico's sideburns in the wrong place first? So I've looked at this picture so many minutes of times, and this is the first time I've noticed that. Now, I don't know, maybe somebody else would notice it, but really, I don't think you will notice it. So, um, so have confidence, go in armed with your, with your white gel pen, and, um, and don't worry. Also, another thing I do is I have this very bad habit of making heads too small. Um, so you know, a lot of my drawings of people um, with dark hair, you'll see the, the, the ghost of a line underneath where I've tried to um, make the head bigger. But if, again, if you've done that and you can't get rid of it, you can't hide it, gel pen, just get rid of it, no problem. So as you can see, I'm still on the really... A really nice scratchy line. I haven't started putting in my dark lines yet, but I do like a heavy line. So I will when I'm comfortable with my lines and I'd say, yeah, yeah, I've got the feel of it. And you'll know, you'll know immediately looking at your subject. So just putting in the back of his head and his Federico likes, likes a big woolly cardigan. So he's got the curly back of his, of his cardigan and he's got the, the shirt which is his head is kind of a little bit low into his neck. So his shirt is kind of bunched up a little bit, but he's got nice posture. So 
there's his arm coming out. And we'll just give him a hand so that we can have a little opportunity to paint it. And by the way, you might notice with the foodie pen, it's just so nice for really quick gestural lines. There's a nice, and there's his other line, there's his other arm. I'll just put that in. Okay, so there's his basic, basic outline. And as I say, oh, and props, by the way, are everything. Um, your sketchbook that the person is holding, if you're drawing a sketcher or the chair, um, you can hide a multitude or you can avoid drawing a multitude by including props. And they also, it's really nice to give a setting as well. So I'm just going to give my young lady some colorful hair before I go on to Federico's painting. So about the hair, whoops. About hair, your hair has got, it's always got a shine, except for very curly hair, which does have a shine, but the shine is around the outside. So your hair, it's dark at the roots, I'm just using my little palette, which is absolutely gorgeous, I must say. What's lovely about painting on ceramic is that the, you can see the paint doesn't ball up. So plastic is the worst for paint going into little balls. Um, I use a metal lid of my paint box when I'm out and about. Um, but ceramic is always the is always the, the surface of choice. Glad you like it. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I mean, I used to carry a great when I first started urban sketching. I used to carry a, a huge ceramic palette with me, um, but it, really huge and really heavy. Um, and I had so many heavy things and little did I know I was just, you could make, you can make your urban sketching kit so, so light. But mm. the bad thing about a big, big palette is that one drop and that's it. It's gone. It's smashed. Yeah. But with a little fella like this, I, I, I think you're safe enough. So there's her hair. And when that's dry, I'm going to give another little bit of color. Just drop a little bit in. Now, as you know, as you probably know, or you may know, with watercolor, there's two basic ways of applying color. There's wet on wet and there's wet on dry. And wet on wet is exactly that. It means putting extra color in before your paint has started to dry. And wet on dry means not nearly dry or half dry. It means bone dry. So the latter is, is what you're going to do for glazing and you'll build up your color gradually. And the former means that you can add um, color with abandon um, and, and you get a lovely, lovely sort of a wishy-washy effect. However, if you add extra paint to any stage in between very wet and fresh or bone dry, you're going to risk lots of dreadful things like cauliflowers, which I personally love, but I know most people don't. Or you might get um, a muddy effect with your paint. Now I'm just going to slop on a little bit of, I'm, I'm going to use my Kalinsky Sable because it's so nice. I'm just going to slop on a little bit of, whoops, a little bit of Payne's gray. Now I never use black ever as a, as a sketcher. I just don't have black in my palette and I never will, I hope, because well, I suppose if I do one day, it'll be because I, I want to. So it won't be such a okay. disaster. But I do like alternatives to black. I think that there's a richness in Payne's Grey and Indigo that is um, that is lost with black watercolour. But horses for courses again. And um, I do know some watercolours who use black and who make it look amazing. Just that every time I try to do it, it doesn't look amazing. So... I'm just going to fill in a little bit of nice concentrated paints gray around the hair and around the hand. As you can see, I've, I've gone away from my Kalinsky sable and back to my nice slim pointed rosemary brush. My rosemary, my R13, because I want to be nice and delicate. But what's nice about the Kolinsky Sable, it's just colouring her phone as well. And by the way, black, another thing you're going to come across a lot is black phones against black t-shirts and black sweaters and so on. Just give a tiny little rim of white around the edge of the phone. That's all you need to do. And then it's perfectly obvious that there's a phone in the hand. Okay, so back to Federico. So honours almost done. When her hair is dry, um, I'll go over it a little bit with a few streaks of pen. And now on to Federico and his lovely complexion. 
So I'm go- Frederico is, mm, is he more or less the same color as Honor? I think he's more or less the same tone as Honor. So we'll use the same collection of paints. So it's a little bit of yellow ochre, a little bit of opera pink thrown in. So you're making this kind of color that looks like um, sort of like a bad sun sunbed job. And then you need to to sort of dilute it down with a little bit of water so that it doesn't look so so angry. And away you go. And then you can add little bits of yellow ochre to tone it down a bit. Now that's a little bit too light. So I'm going to add a little bit more to that. And then quick, quick, quick. Now you might you might see there that I've left a tiny little streak of white on the ball of his cheek. And I go back to being dark again when I hit his nose. And anything that's in shadow, now it looks a bit blotchy. Oh, and another thing, by the way, when I started using watercolor, I don't know, 30 odd years ago, I suppose, I couldn't understand how could people like this medium that blobs up in the corner when you're painting it. But what I didn't know was that just leave it alone and it will settle out. So I'll do the same with the hand. So don't be tempted to smooth out just smooth out blobs, just let them be, and they will flatten out. And for some reason, I gave Federico a very pink lower lip, and I like a policeman with his notes. If I did it on the day, then that's what I go with. So there he is, he's getting a nice pink lower lip. And I'm going to throw in that little bit of pink onto the ear, just like I referred to earlier, just to warm it up a little bit. And it's the tiniest little dab of pink, because I'm not giving him not even a bright pink ears, just a little bit of a, just a little bit of a, a warming up. Um, if you feel you've put on too much paint and it's just sort of flooding a little bit, you can just very, you can either wipe your brush on the side of your, your water container, or you can just wipe it off gently like that. And it goes from being the thing that you apply color with to the thing that you mop up color with. So it becomes like a mop. Now I'm just going to give Federico so nice. Federico had really nice hair. He, he had really, you could, he, you know, he had a beautiful haircut, really, really smart hair. And I, I really wanted to capture that, that look of, of the hair really, really going neatly in the right place. And, you know, certainly wasn't all over the place. So that's why I sort of spent a bit longer with the hair strands. And I can't do much more because it'll just go into the, into the skin and then that'll be it. It'll all, it'll all blush hey, out. Virtually, yes, sorry Brittany. to interrupt. Uh, I just want to give you a little ta- time stamp. We're yep. about uh, a little over forty minutes into it. Okay, that's perfect. Yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been keeping an eye on it. I'm hoping that I can get one more in. Um, so I'll go back to Federico. Let me just put honor away altogether. Um, I'm going to go back to Federico and paint in his hair when his skin is a little drier. Um. I'm not that careful about color runs, but I, whoops, but I am when it comes to paint. I'll tell you for when it comes to skin tones, because skin tones are delicate. Um, um, I'd like, for example, yesterday I was drawing uh, a beautiful girl with a lovely, delicate skin tone. And then the hair uh, ran into her, um, into her face. Let me just show you the one I'm doing now. And it made her look like she had a five o'clock shadow. So, um, so that's why I'm a little bit careful with skin tones. So I'm a little bit more inclined to be patient and let them dry. Now, before I draw, this is my younger daughter, Livy. So look at the light on the edge of the ear, look at the light on the back of the neck and the light on the back of the shoulder. That's what we're going to try and capture. When you want to uh, capture the look of a really strong light on a rounded limb, like a neck or an arm, a really good tip is to when you go, you, you're at the light bit, then suddenly it goes dark again at the, at, the, at the boundary between light and dark. And then it starts lightening out again. So this is something I picked up from other artists that I noticed. And I thought, gosh, I wonder, is that an optical illusion or is it really like that? So I began to look at people's, people's limbs in, in sunlight to see was that indeed the case. And it turns out, yes, it is. It's not just an optical illusion. It's just that you have to exaggerate things a little bit as an artist to get the same effect. So you can see, I'm st- again, I'm using my really scritchy little thin side of my nib so that I can get my placement of my lines. I'm really using it almost like a pencil. So 
so that I can make mis loads of mistakes and I won't notice them. So here's, and the little nose is perfectly level with the ear. And of course, when someone's bending down a little bit, the lips are thrown forward a little bit. I tell you, the young girls are the worst to draw because they're just so, and children, they're, and I'll be doing that in the mini workshop. I'll be doing the difference between old and young and male and female. Let me see if I can make this a little bit. So there's her lovely eyelashes. Again, the eye is formed just by that little, merest little triangle. And her lips. And once I'm a little bit more confident, I can go a little bit heavier. And I look at it and I go, ooh, I'm missing half her head, but that's absolutely fine because I only drew it in a very, very light pen. So that's your chance to go in there and to fix anything that you think, ooh, they didn't quite get that right. And as long as you did your first lines with a nice delicate line, del delicate skinny little line, you'll be able to, you'll be able to fix that. Now, a big part of what this drawing is, what makes it nice in my opinion, is the hair being caught in the wind and being blown forward. So I quite like that. And the plait, I like the big, thick, bunchy plait sticking out in the front. So let's just give her a little bit of a turn around for her arm. And then we'll get onto her skin. Okay, so as you can see, I haven't done much with the hair but I'm going to try and get my contouring and my shapes with paint alone. Okay, so before we do that, I might as well fill in Federico now that his face is nice and dry. And I'm going to go with the burnt umber. And you need to leave a nice shiny highlighted patch to show the shine right on the middle of the hair. And it starts getting dark again, just on the far side of the parting. And then you can leave that to dry for a minute or two. And then you can just put a slightly more dilute layer of burnt umber just to soften up the transition so it doesn't go from completely dark to completely light. And again, just going to slop down that little bit of this is the bit I always love, just throwing on with abandon the little bit of Payne's grey, whatever it's doing. So there's his, there's his, his cardigan. We'll let that dry. And it's really fun to just be loose and fresh and something like that, that you can afford to be a little bit, a little bit free. Okay, so back to Livy. And again, just so happens that all three people here are more or less the same skin tone now Livy is that bit more um she's a little bit lighter she was she was quite young when I painted this this was she was been about 11 or 12 something like that so let's just get this face in here again a little bit darker towards the bit where the light is hitting it and then smoothed over towards the rest of the face and that little bit of pink on the ear. So you can see the opera, the opera pink really blends in. It doesn't come out so well under the camera, but the opera really blends in with the, with the watercolor to make a very soft sort of a shell pink. Now, because the paint is completely wet, I can still mix in that little bit of extra dark color there so that it just shows the really dramatic bit where the light is hitting. And of course, it's really important that you keep that level all the way down, not just on the skin, but I'll show you on the clothes as well to show the consistency that the light is hitting all at the exact same place. Now I'm gonna to have to do a little line of white in between or else it's going to go completely color run. So a little bit darker, but if you can see what I'm trying to get at there, the light is hitting all at once. And let's try and get the same thing with the hair now. Can I quickly get a little bit of lemon yellow? Where is my paint box? Um, I was, oh, I know where it is, sorry. Um, here we go. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to mix that a little bit with the hair so that we don't just have yellow ochre. We have a little bit of cadmium yellow mixed in to give that nice blonde look. Plenty of white. Plenty of white to keep it nice and shiny and darkening up towards the portion in the middle. Leave a little bit more dark where her eye is. And then that little bit of opera for her mouth. So if I was drawing Livy in the field, I would probably wait for it to dry and then give a second little layer on top just to deepen it up a little bit. Just fit in her plait on the far side. So quick, quick, quick. And what, as I say, you will never have very long to capture your, um, your subject in the field. You just, it's just not the way it works. So you have, to, which is absolutely fine because to be honest, it's that pressure that makes your work a million times better than when you're sitting at home with a photo and you're, you know, you're making bad thoughts about the photo and you're going, oh, I just can't make it look like it's right. But all those thoughts and all those strong feelings of frustration, they dissolve when you're in the field, not because you become an amazing artist with the click of a finger, but because there just isn't time for you to start fretting about all the things that are, could possibly go wrong. Your job when you're in the field is to get that figure down. Um, and I really find very strongly that once people start saying, okay, I'm going to commit to this, I'm going to start just capturing people. First of all, they find they get addicted um, quite quickly. They're just softened off Federico's um, crown of highlight a little bit. Well, you get you you will find you get addicted um, to sketching, to sketching in the wild. And personally, I just think there's nothing better. So that's basically it really <laughs> <laughs> that was such a good demo uh we're, you're getting a lot of compliments and we have a few people already signed up for your mini workshop do you want to just oh, explain great. a little bit yeah absolutely bit? Yeah. so um any more any more questions any more any comments at all that i can expand upon yeah um we got a couple questions earlier that i saved uh, how do you pick your colors? Um, the, do you know prior to what you're going to sketch, you just have an array of skin tone available colors or? I have those five colors always, always those five colors. Um, I'll show you my palette. Um, it's all half pans except for the big double one, which is sap green. And that's not because I use loads of sap green, that one there. It's because um, I just happen to have that in a, in a full pan so um i have my colors and like all watercolor sketch artists i fret about my choices a lot and wonder if i could do better um but this is the i i really am not missing any color in that now there's a lot of colors in that i mean there's what uh, 21 colors in there 20 because one of them's a double that's a lot of colors you don't need that many but I just decided oh I can't be without you know hot orange I can't be without Naples yellow so you keep discovering colors you can't possibly live without um but um yes I do change my my palette around from time to time but it doesn't really I haven't changed it for a very long time and there's I I'm not missing any colors I don't feel Oh, funny I had turquoise because I have turquoise. <laughs> right. So um, my advice would be to err on the side of more hot colors, more intense, bright colors than muted colors because you can you, because you can always mute down your colors, but you can't hot them up. You can't brighten them up. So um, if you're going to um, if you're if you're wavering between two colors, choose the brighter ones. Um, another question. Uh, someone said they. Heard that opera pink fades a lot. Um, do you yeah. find that or do you find well, it uh, like it, that? that? No, that is true. And um, my my watercolor supplier, because I um, I work with Roman Schmal, so I sell his paints just, it's kind of like a, 
I just I have some so I sell them um, and I really wish that Roman um, would supply the the opera color but he flat out refused because he says he will not have any paints in his range that are fugitive and I was like please and he said no so <laughs> that was the end of that um, so yeah the answer is the short answer is yes it is very fugitive but it doesn't apply to me as a problem because I don't sell work as on for hanging on the wall. That's not what I do. Everything I have is in a sketchbook. Nothing gets torn out. And if anybody wants to buy my work, um, I the only way I, I produce it is as GK prints. So, and that's got archival link that doesn't fade. So you can do what you want with it. You can hang it in front of a window and it won't fade. But I do, I am very conscious of that. It's a very good question. And do not paint portraits with opera pink if you are intending to hang them on the wall because your people will be completely washed out. I'm really glad the person asked that actually. Um, do you have people... a color? Oh, sorry. No, 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 go on. Do you have a color that um, you recommend instead if people were to? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would say quinacridone pink. Um, I'm still, I'm, I'm still actually waiting on delivery at the moment from my friend Roman. Um, he's going to send me some fuchsia. Um, he calls it fuchsia, and I'm dying to find out um, how close it is to opera. And um, as he says, it's completely not fugitive, so it might be my go-to once it does the job for me. But so far, only opera has produced the color that I like. I'm hoping to find an alternative. Uh, and then what was the name of your urban sketchbook? Oh, uh, do, 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 a pity I don't have a copy here. It's called the Urban Sketching Handbook. Um, and it is in the range, the Urban Sketching Handbook by Quarto. And my particular book is called Drawing Expressive People. Um, so, um, uh, I recommend it. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, if you want to know my entire family, then buy it because who else could I draw except my family? The, you know, um, sure, I drew a lot of people in cafes and planes. It's drawing people in airplanes is a really good way to get over your nerves because all you're worried about is can you get them finished before you land? Whereas, you know, before that, you might have all sorts of bad thoughts about other ways you might land. So um, so that's I, I really love drawing people in public transport and in airports. Airports is the best because people are in a bubble of nerves and anxiety and they do not notice anybody drawing them. Um, so, yeah, just keep a tiny sketchbook with you at all times. Draw people wherever you are and enjoy it. Uh, and then did you end up using the white gel pen? Oh, um, why don't I just do that right now and fix Honor's chin. So um, I like to use the number 10. Wait, now let me just show you before and after. So here she's got a little bit of a, a double chin, as you can see. So let's just get rid of that. Again, an excellent question. Thanks for reminding me. And I will flick, flick, flick over the line. And voila, it has completely disappeared. So your white gel pen is your great friend. And uh, I also don't like what I did here with Livy's mouth. So let's see if I can do something with that. Um, and you can be quite, you can be quite, you can be quite drastic. Just give it a couple of seconds to dry. Um, and once that's dry, I can go in again with a little chin and um, draw it in the place where it should have been. So um, as I say, it's really, really useful and, um, yeah, I, I, as I say, I'm sometimes out there sketching and I go, oh, I forgot my gel pen, I forgot my white gel pen. Now, for me, it doesn't really matter so much because when I scan it, I can use the erase tool to get rid of it. But I also want my sketchbooks to look pretty. I want my sketchbooks, I want to have a happy sigh when I look at my sketchbooks and be happy with what I've done. So, um, so yeah, white gel pen, definitely. Yeah, big box of different assorted sizes. Also, they're brilliant for writing words on menus and as an urban sketcher, you will frequently be sitting in a cafe uh, trying to copy the nice menu of specials when you're on your holidays and you need a white gel pen for that. So you will never regret buying one. Sorry. And does that work because you use a um, bright white sketchbook or do you use like a natural tone? Um, I only use a bright white sketchbook. Where is my current one? I only use a bright white sketchbook. All my paper is white. Um, I did use um, I did use a, a tinted paper for a sketch of the Easter Bunny a couple of days ago because I wanted to use gouache. Um, but to be honest with you, I, I, I was reminded of what a what a 
to do and palaver it is to break out your gouache. There's nothing like a box of watercolor. So easy, so quick, so convenient. Um, many, many is the family gathering that no one has even noticed me sketching people around the place. Well, certain people who should remain nameless, my husband, will say, <laughs> will say, oh God, you're not sketching again. What a bore. He's English. So, um, so, but you just have to ignore people. Um, you do have to develop a bit of a bit of a skin if you're going to be sketching people because you will meet resistance. But um, but just bribe them. If it's your kids, bribe them. If it's someone you, you just buy them a drink, whatever. But people, they they just you know they just want to say, oh, don't draw me. But they'll always they'll always agree eventually. I think some people get flattered by it too, like strangers in cafes. They do. They love it. They really do. They really do. Um, and it becomes it can become a really special moment when somebody comes over and just goes. Oh my God, oh my God, that's amazing. Oh, thank you so much. And it's really nice because you've made their day and. They never say, oh, you know, can I have it? Um, they never do. Sometimes I feel a bit like being generous. I don't usually because they're my sketches, my sketches. <laughs> but um, I have heard of um, people, you know, just take, I heard one girl who was drawing some beautiful old Spanish ladies on the subway. And she said that she really rocked it. She was the best sketch she'd ever done. She's so pleased with herself. And just before the train pulled to a halt, these older ladies, very glamorous, covered in jewels, one of them said, that's for me, grabbed it off her and left. Oh. <laughs> but that's never happened to me. She was just standing there with her empty hands, wondering what had just happened. But um, generally speaking, it's a really lovely, um, really fun experience and really, really, it's just a lovely moment of connection, really. It's nobody ever minds. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you mind just uh, explaining a little bit of what you're going to be doing in the mini workshop with us? Yes, I will. The mini workshop is going to be um, something of the same, um, but this time it's going to concentrate on the differences between old faces and young faces um, and the difference between, between males and females, because there are very marked differences. I mean, you can even see with Federico, look at his strong, strong profile and his, his heavy brow um, compared to well, actually, I made Livy look a bit sort of masculine there, but um, generally speaking, there's there are lots and look, I mean, look, honors little face. I mean, you know, very very delicate little features. It's it is there are lots of differences, and that's before you even get to the differences of the way they carry themselves. And it's fascinating. The whole thing is fascinating. You're you're an observer of the world when you're when you're in a sketcher. It's it's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Um, a lot of positive feedback in the chat. We have a, a few signups already to your mini workshop. I also dropped a link, everybody, uh, if you wouldn't mind just checking it out. It's just a quick less than two minute survey, um, multiple um, choice question survey. It just helps us improve co content for future demos and whatnot. Uh, or if you don't think we need to improve on anything and you just want to tell us how great of a job we did, we'll appreciate that too. Always uh, good too. <laughs> and um, don't forget to tag us with hashtag at your mini workshop and you'll be entered in a monthly draw uh, that's done to win uh, $50 to spend in the at your lab store. We also have a new giveaway that we started that's a weekly giveaway. Um, and for that, you'll tag us with hashtag at your studio. And um, the winner of that uh, will receive a random kind of prize from Etcher. It could be a mini workshop voucher, a sketchbook, uh, an Etcher lab store voucher. Who knows what you're going to get? That's very exciting. Um, nothing like not knowing what the, what you're going to get in the raffle, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's kind of the anti uh, anticipation can be fun sometimes. Yeah, yeah, it makes it fun. So yeah, no, that's that sounds. And I must say, um, of the products that I've used from Etcher, I, 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 I'm really excited to try the paints, which as I say, only arrived a couple of hours ago now. But the um, I love the paper in the hot press. I haven't tried the cold press and I adore my little mini palette. I can't wait to give that a, a shot out in the field. Glad you like our products. And yeah, I'm excited to uh, find out what you think of the other ones. Yeah. Um, also, if you tag us with uh, the few that I just mentioned, so a hashtag at your mini workshop or hashtag at your studio, uh, Roisin actually will be able to see your work a lot easier if you followed along with her. I would love to see what you've done. And if you ask for a critique, I will give it. Um, I don't make any comments of any sort of critique nature unless you ask, because I never know what, um, you know, you just, I just wouldn't do that. So you have to say something like critique, welcome. Um, and then I'll be delighted to, to give you a couple of tips. Awesome. 
Thank you everybody so much. Um, I, again, my name is Brittany from Etcher Studio with you today. Thank you, Roisin, for joining us. You did such a good job. Well, Couldn't have you, asked for a better explanation. Well, you're very good to say so. I, I, I was really honored to be invited to teach with you. Really honored. Um, and I still use my, my Etcher, uh, which you can't see, there you go. I still use my Etcher. Uh, pencil case, my field, my field case that actually were good enough to send me about, I think it must be three or four years ago now. And it's still, the zip isn't broken and I've, it's, everything's perfect. And I've used it almost every day for about four years. So really, really quality product there. Yeah, I'm glad to know it's held up. You got the retro look one there. They don't yeah. look like that anymore. They're all black now. Um, I have the retro one, yeah. yeah. I love that one. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, thank you, everybody. Um, if you wouldn't mind filling out that little survey, that means a lot to um, us here at Etcher. Um, Roisin, quickly, what's your Instagram account? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's uh, at Roisin Cure, R-O-I-S-I-N-C-U-R-E. Um, and if I'm, I'm a thousand away from 10,000 and once I get to 10,000, I'm going to do extra long demo videos. Um, so I do live videos twice a week at the moment on Friday evenings and Sunday evenings, six o'clock Irish time. Um, but I only get an hour before Instagram, you know, throw you off. So, um, I, I, I'm not sure, even sure if I've got the, got it right, but I think once you get to 10,000, good stuff happens. Um, so yeah. Um, and I try to keep you entertained. I try to give you a bit of value with my, with my Instagram. For sure. All right, everybody, I'm going to end the stream now. Thank you again for coming. It was lovely to have you all here. Thanks Bye for now. Coming. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.